Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so I, yeah, I work for Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. And uh, I am a county forester, so I cover, um, Windsor County is a big county with lots of parcels in it. And so I split this county uh, with another county forester who covers the northern half, um, and a little bit of Orange County. I cover the southern half of Windsor. Um, so that's from, uh, you know, Bridgewater, Woodstock, what's the other one up there I'm missing? Heartland, down. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, there we go. So introduction, um, just Ralph asked me to cover a couple things. I've been working with him um, on EAB, started an EAB kind of awareness and task force group. Um, and I've been doing presentations with him and he asked me to talk about, you know, what is EAB, how to identify it, where it is, um, how does it spread, what can private property owners do, and then some resources for, you know, private property owners, and then, you know, open up the question. And so Emerald Ashbore is this, um, small green beetle. Um, it is non-native, which is why we're really concerned about it. So it came from Asia. Um, it attacks just species of ash trees. Um, so it there are several species of ash trees and it only attacks ash, um, but will attack all of the ash tree species that we have here. Um, where it is native, it has um, the trees have evolved with it, with it, sorry, and it's, um, you know, like any other native pathogen that we have, it usually attacks um, stress trees, but all trees are able to continue to live while being infested by them. Here where it's not, um, they haven't co-evolved and it isn't native, it is, um, you know, close to 99% um, fatal and a tree is infested with it. And so we're seeing across the US where it's already um, infested a lot of trees, just, you know, 99% mortality, which is pretty significant um, when you're just, when you're thinking about that many trees dying. So um, you know, it, it, the way it kills trees is it's boring into the trees. Here, I'll, I'll progress to the next slide. So it, it begins small investation usually in the upper canopy um, and it is pouring into the trees and then the larvae are um, essentially girdling the tree by eating the cambium layer of the tree which is that layer that transports water and nutrients um, just under the bark and as the population increases it you know girdles it more and more and you begin to see more of a stressed out tree and eventually it kills it. Um, and so some of the, the signs and symptoms we're looking for when we're looking for this in our trees now, so it, I'll um, we'll go over where it is right now, but it is in Vermont and it is in many surrounding states um, and in Canada. And what we're looking for is um, the woodpecker plucking. So woodpeckers are going after that larva that are right under the, um, right under the bark. So you'll see, um, we also call this blonding. We're looking for thinning canopies because as the canopy gets, you know, as more and more the tree dies and is girdled, you're going to see less green foliage on the tree. We're looking for bark splitting um, because the tree is stressed and it is, um, you know, often cracking where there's a lot of larva under that bark. Cormic branching, this is a pretty common um, reaction from a lot of trees when they're stressed. Um, and so this sign alone, or really any of the signs alone, um, are not going to say, yes, that's definitely amber lash borer, but it's, we're looking for, you know, a, a bunch of bees and a bunch of trees in the area but this is a sign that a tree is stressed. And then we're also looking for these D-shaped exit holes. They're fairly small. They're, you know, smaller. They're probably a quarter of the 
size of your pinky nail. Um, not very large, but they're very distinctly D-shaped um, rather than round. Lots of other native um, native pathogens are round uh, and we'll see round holes, but the emerlash bar is, is this D-shape. So the larva, once it uh, matures and it, it becomes a beetle, that's when they're boring out of the, um, from the cocaine layer out through the bark. And that's when we're seeing these deep exit holes. Another um, sign is if we peel back the bark, if we're seeing some of the symptoms and then we want to investigate more, we might peel back some of the bark. And um, Emerald Ash 4 has these really distinctive S-shaped galleries. Um, so they, um, the more that, the larger the infestation in the trees, tighter they are together. But even when there's just a few, they're going to be um, very S-shaped. They don't go up and down um, and they don't really meander, you know, around or go in circles like a lot of our, our native pathogens go so in, in Kind of circles and, and um, you know, cross their paths. And so if you're seeing any of these, um, we always like to put this, uh, this on how to report a suspected infestation. If you're seeing some of these signs and symptoms, we have a website called VT Invasives. Um, and we can go through this a little bit more during the question if you would like, but if, um, I'm always happy to be contacted directly um, with photos and description, or there, we also have this website and you can go to get involved, um, report, and then, um, and sorry, I can't quite read that online, reporting an invasive insect. Um, and that's the, the process that you go through. So this is a little chicken and the egg, I'm not sure. I'm never sure which slides to show first, whether it's the identification or where it is, but um, this is the spread in Vermont. Um, we are seeing lots of infestation popping so that the found infestation that's identified um, is right in the center of the orange dot. And then we are putting um, a five mile radius around that as a confirmed infested area. So um, by the time we see it back to that slide where the population grows in the tree, by the time we're identifying it, we're um, suspecting that it's been there for a few years. And then um, beyond that, it may be likely, um, so it's a high risk area, it's likely to be in that yellow area around. So if we zoom in a little bit closer to our area and Windsor County, we have not, luckily we've not had um, a confirmed infestation in Southern Windsor. Um, you know, they, these areas overlap, but there hasn't been an actual population found yet in Southern Windsor County. Um, we have infestations that are over the border in New Hampshire, and likely those insects have crossed the river, have flown across the river. And, um, it's possible they're here, but we have not found an actual population that we identified. And so we're still inter very interested in, um, you know, knowing if somebody's finding signs and symptoms and trying to identify those. And so the, the way that this insect, I've kind of alluded to it, but the way that it spreads, you know, this insect is a flying insect and spread one to two miles a year. But if you look back at this map um, and how all of these um, spots are showing up, it's more, you know, most likely that it is being moved, um, you know, in the back of a pickup, in firewood, in infested wood. And so, um, that's the main concern, trying to slow the spread of this insect um, that's being really being spread by humans and trying to prevent that as much as possible. All right. <clears throat> 
And so, um, if you're a private landowner or a concerned citizen, I put this kind of flow chart that says, you know, all, all the ash trees in Vermont, which there are, um, it's 5% of all trees in Vermont are ash trees, but they do show up um, in stands of trees um, a little more commonly. So there, they might be somewhere between 10 to, um, you know, 50% of a stand of trees might be ash trees. And then there might not be any ash trees in another area. Um, but if you think about losing, you know, if you think about losing 5% of the trees in Vermont, it might not seem like a lot, but if you think about losing 50% of the trees in a given area um, or stand, like if you have a wood lot, 50% of your trees or even 30% of your trees dying, um, that is a lot more. And so some of the trees are, you know, owned by private landowners, and we'll get to that a little bit more. Um, and then a lot of, you know, a lot of these trees are on public land. A lot of them are municip um, you know, municipalities are owning those trees. So it's in ways, which is what I've been working with um, Ralph on and trying to get, trying to help towns think about the impact it's going to have on their right of ways. Um, also in, you know, village centers and town forests. Um, so there, there are, are a lot of different ownerships and a lot of different ways to look at how these trees are going to be impacted. So if we look a little bit closer at private landowners, um, you might have trees in a forest, which is, if it's in current use, it's a managed forest and we're managing that for lots of different resources, water quality, but also timber production, um, wildlife habitat, um, a lot of people recreate in their forests. Some landowners have forests and those are unmanaged. And then a lot of people um, have just an ash tree in their yard or a few ash trees in their yard. Um, but regardless of where they are, they're all going to be impacted by emerald ash borer. And so it's important to, you know, think about where they are might um, might impact how you react, but knowing that that if you're looking around and there's an ash tree, it will be um, affected is a good to start. And so this is put together this kind of question sheet. There are a lot of questions to think about. You know, what do ash trees look like? Um, you know, just figuring out how to identify ash trees. And I didn't include that um, in today's presentation because there's a lot to cover with emerald ash borer and, and the impacts, but happy to anytime go over, um, you know, go over ash tree identification and we have lots of great resources on that. Um, you know, and then also what are your options? So you, once you know and identify an ash tree, what are your options depending on where it is? You know, where is the tree, um, where might these trees fall? If it's in your forest and the trees fall all the time and it doesn't really matter, then you might not be so concerned. But if it's hanging over your house or your favorite picnic spot, um, you might be concerned when that tree starts to die. And then also where are your nearest known infestations? So where are you located um, in comparison to the other areas that are known infestations in the state? Why might you choose a certain approach to managing that tree? If it's, you know, safety, you're going to probably um, be a little bit more concerned. If you are thinking about ecological value of retaining some ash trees for a possible, um, you know, 99% of them are going to succumb to emerald ash borer, but there is going to be 1%, and maybe you are. Um, you know, if it's not hanging over your house and it's in your forest, maybe you're willing to sacrifice that tree and see if it has some genetic resistance. Um, then there's also the kind of when questions. When is, um, when is it the best time to do the work? When do you need to act in terms of, you know, seasons or in terms of, um, you know, planning and, and setting things up? Um, it might take a while to get somebody into your 
backyard to cut that tree down safely. Um, and then who needs to be contacted? That can be, you know, that could be me to come out and give you some just kind of general advice. It could be, um, you know, your power company, if it's hanging over your, your line to your house, it could be um, an arborist. It could be a forester if you have a, a forest management plan. And, um, you know, how will the work get done? So that's, um, you know, again, kind of similar to the who, but um, how is it going to get done and you know, timeline and expectations for how that work's going to get done. And then um, this is a, don't have a great transition slide, but you know we're we're looking for if you're a private landowner and anywhere in the state, we're looking to slow the spread of the insect. And so the best thing that we can do to um, you know collect more information, make informed decisions, um, take you know take actions strategically rather than reactively the spread throughout the state and so we've created the state has created some guidelines um, to reduce the risk of spread and allow landowners you know if you're a forest landowner allow you to utilize your ash trees um, for lumber if that's what you have been growing them for um, the recommendations and i don't know if it, sorry back i'll back up this uh is a qr code in the corner and so you can hold your phone up to it i'm also happy to supply this and other resources to anybody that would like it but you can hold your phone up and take a picture and it brings you to the website that has all of our slow to spread recommendations um and so these apply to the infested area that's that um fried egg on the map to where there are known infestations um, these are recommended practices for non-flight and, um, sorry, for non-flight periods and periods because the insect is flying. It flies during a certain time of year. It doesn't fly in the fall and winter. Um, and so there are periods of time when it's safe to move wood around as long as it's being processed. Um, and then it also, you know, the practices that we're recommending vary by the product and the risk. So it's different for firewood versus, um, you know, chipped wood or tops and the risk of spreading. And, um, and then we also, there's also, you know, anything that's visibly infested or possibly um, must follow the guidance because you can't move an invasive species around the state knowingly. And so if you are a forest landowner, your recommended practices, um, or recommendations for optimal practices, I'm sorry, is that you, um, you know, harvest and transport ash during the non-flight period. So when the insect is not moving out of the wood or going anywhere, and that's October 1st through April 30th, and then you want to use markets that treat the products. So if it's um, you know, chips, they're going to be chipping them up really small. If it is um, firewood, then that would be um, kiln dried firewood. There's um, you know, other options for treating the bark off of logs and then letting the logs sit there. So if you strip the bark off, the insect can't live in the bark. Um, and then, you know, especially don't, don't move untreated ash firewood outside the infested area because it can live in firewood for up to two years. Um, and if you, you know, if you've stacked it and you don't think anything is living in it and it's dry, those uh, insects can, can remain for a while. Um, during the flight period, there are some uh, other recommendations, you know, chipping some stuff, um, you know, there, these, Get a little bit into the nitty gritty if you actually have something planned. So I'll move on so we have some question, time for questions. Um, and then, you know, we're also very interested, I'm interested in having ash 
remain as part of our landscape. And so that takes some really um, thoughtful planning. And so we do have this insect, but we're also hoping to have ash trees remain on the landscape after we kind of have this first wave of emerald ash borer. And so we can do things to, you know, keep ash on the landscape and hope that some of them are, um, are going to be, uh, have some genetic resistance. We can also try to promote ash into the future because young ash are not initially impacted and we do have um, biological controls that are very successful. And so if we, if we go out and we cut all the ash trees down, um, then we'll kind of repeat history like um, with American chestnut where there's actually quite a bit of genetic resistance, but we lost a lot of it because everybody cut cut all those trees down and it's hard to tell once they're dead, whether they're genetically resistant or not. Um, and so we're hoping to, you know, promote some ash. We're also very concerned that, um, that when ash, if it just dies off of the landscape, we're going to have problems with invasive species filling those gaps in the can in the forest canopy. And so doing some active management against um, invasive just just take that space. And some, uh, just lastly, some resources that are very helpful if you're dealing with, um, you know, more urban trees or for municipalities. The Vermont Community Forestry is a, um, a division of Forest Parks and Recreation. And so I deal mostly with, um, you know, forest ecosystems and managing forests as a whole. And they are wonderful at, um, at managing kind of yard trees and managing the interactions of, um, you know, municipalities and the public. They um, have worked hard recently on uh, the tree warden statutes and, and helping tree wardens understand their role um, and towns understand and what tree wardens do. And then there's also um, vpinvasives.org. That's just a great resource for all things invasive um, and getting you connected with resources in that way. Lastly, I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Can you switch that back to the, um, take the screen away? Yes, of course. See everybody. Uh, stop sharing. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, anyone have any questions for Hannah? Looking for hands. And I remember I have to scroll through. Paul, go ahead. Uh, good morning. A very interesting presentation. What's the like most likely outcome over the next, let's say, 10 years as you look out? Is it, you know, give us the pessimistic, optimistic, most likely outcome? Sure. So uh, the most likely outcome is it will kind of sweep through Vermont and kill a large population of ash trees. But um, once we are aware that there are infestations in an area, um, there has been very successful um, biological controls. And so biological control is a good biological control when it only targets the insect or whatever you're you're looking for um, and so we can't preemptively release biological controls because there isn't a population of you know you can't release them preemptively because they they won't survive but if we can release them as soon as we know there's a population they've been pretty successful and so kind of um, optimistic is that we try to slow the spread as long as possible and learn as much as possible from other states that are dealing with these infestations. You know, Michigan has been dealing with infestations for since 2008, I believe. Um, and so the more we can learn, the better. Um, and hopefully we can keep lots of ash trees kind of scattered throughout the landscape to have some biological control or some sorry some genetic resistance plus the biological control we'll certainly see a reduced population of ash trees in Vermont but hopefully we won't lose them completely and that will give us time 
to, you know, interplant with other things, um, especially in areas um, where there are monocultures of ash, like um, black ash swamps up kind of in the um, northwest of Vermont, there's a lot of uh, black ash swamps. And if those are completely devastated without um, planting before before all the ash dies, then the water table in those areas will will raise up so much that trees can't uh, grow in those areas. And so we're trying to, you know, kind of quickly plant and think of strategies in those areas so that we don't lose that ecosystem completely. That's kind of hopefully what, you know, hopefully we can we can find this balance. Okay. Anyone else? Hand up. Uh, Brett, go ahead. Yes. Um, do you know, uh, is there any kind of invasive species that is close by to Vermont that attacks maple trees? There are, um, so uh, now it's escaping me, long, uh, long horn beetle, why am I, Asian long horn beetle, <laughs> sorry, they're, all the names get crossed. There are populations that are, you know, relatively close, if you're thinking of New England, um, there are some populations in New York and in Massachusetts, but those populations are very well, um, you know, under quarantine and they have not been moving, those populations haven't been moving outside of those um, identified areas. So kind of a yes and no, like yes, there is something, but they've done a very good job at quarantining it. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, anyone else with a hand? I just had a quick one, so, oh, uh, Tom, go ahead. Thanks, I uh, really appreciate your uh, discussion today. I'm curious, and I don't mean to completely change the topic away from em emerald ash borers, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are, you know, are two or three of your other top concerns about the forests here in Vermont? Um, yeah, there are lots, um, you know, uh, I would say one of the concerns is, um, you know, top concern is invasive plants, um, actually woody invasive plants are, um, you know, pose a huge risk to forests. If we are not controlling inv wood woody invasive plants and they, you know, are here and then we something disturbs the overstory, whether it's, you know, active forest management or a microburst or something like that, those areas could quickly not be forested um, anymore because the invasives can, you know, choke out any native regeneration from, you know, poking up through that shrubbed under layer of those invasives. So that's, you know, that's a huge risk. They also change soil composition, They're, you know, pretty, pretty detrimental to the entire ecosystem. Um, but it's also nearly impossible to, or I would say impossible to eradicate them across the landscape. And so we are trying to, um, you know, balance, balance them and knowing that they're here, but trying to also keep our forests intact. Um, so that's one, I would say another risk is always um, fragmentation and development. And that's, you know, one of the main goals of the current use program is to try to have a working landscape that allows people to, um, you know, use it as a forest, as a forest and, and uh, keep it in the forested ecosystem and economy um, without having it developed and, and paved over, you know, um, Tree, you know, if you cut trees in the process of forestry, even if that's a clear cut, the trees inevitably in New England will grow back as long as they're, you know, with the caveat of invasives being in that area. But if you cut them down and, you know, landscape or cut them down and pave the area or cut them down and build things there, it isn't going to be forest. Um, even if you wait 10 years, it's not going to be forest. So that's a big risk. Um, and then, you know, just generally climate change as a whole is changing, changing the system, changing the 
web patterns. Um, we have really big rain events and really long dry spells. And so our extremes are stressing a lot of trees out and leaving them susceptible to um, you know, things that normally wouldn't kill them. That's okay. Any other hands going up? Scrolling back and forth. Uh, what I was going to mention, I, I'm not sure how realistic this is. I use the uh, my agency natural resource atlas daily. Yep. It has some great layers. Is there ever going to be a EAB layer? There is. Yep. Yeah. Oh, they have one in there already. Yeah. Oh, I haven't even looked at that one. Okay. I'm yep. so used to the contours and uh, flood floodways and things like that. Yeah. So you have one for the emerald ash borer. I have to look yep, that there up. There is. Um, there also is through the VT Invasives website. You can also get to. Um, it's the same like base map as ANR Atlas, but has mm -hmm. um, just the emerald ash borer also through. Good to know. Website. Anyone else? Well, if not, well, thank you very much, Hannah. That was a great job. Appreciate yeah, all the problem. information. Again, Hannah, if you have a pen and paper handy, it's hannah.dallas at vermont.gov. If you wish to email her, uh, slides are available um, um, on requests, as I think she said, if you wish. And uh, go to the websites as well. So thanks again. Appreciate it. Yeah. Have a great day. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Take care.